Well, it's a beautiful sunny North Dakota day. It's great to see you, even if it may be through your windshield. We'll see you and come around and uh, greet you later on. Don't be too fast to go. What a good turnout for uh, eight weeks of COVID, huh? Next weekend, we're back in the sanctuary as well as midweek service. Wednesday night now at 7 o'clock because we got a lot of daylight and farmers need to work while the, there's still light. We know that. And of course, as uh, workers of the Lord, we need to work while there's still day because I think we all know that John 9 to 4 is, uh, 9 and 4 is now coming to pass. That we have the night coming when no one can work. It's beginning to fall. But every moment that we have, let's make it count for Jesus Christ. Of course, I'm Pastor Kyle Huckins here of Ashley Baptist Church. We are just about to begin our 125th year this summer. And I would dare say we have never had a drive-in service for cars. Maybe they did for wagons in the old days. I'm not really sure. But it's a possibility. But I know that they haven't done one as far as automobiles are concerned. And as you see on your program today, you've got all of the songs. You've also got our scripture for today and the order of service. Uh, we say that a church alive is worth the drive. My friends, uh, in Sardis, in the Revelation, John wrote that that church had a name that it was alive, but it was dead. It was coming close to finishing up, but there were just a few who were left that had not soiled their garments. And so we need to be a church that is alive in Jesus Christ because he's alive. As we were marking last month, he still lives and our God reigns now and forever. We're going to go ahead and start with a little call to worship here. Uh, we had Ray Gehring suggest that we go a cappella. I think uh, that turned out to be a pretty good idea. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. If I die, let me die in the army. Got my war clothes on in the army of the Lord. Got my war clothes on in the army. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. If I die, let me die in the army. We used to sing that to get things going in these days. Even the old white boy likes some of that black music. You know, they're just as saved as we are. <laughs> in fact, we might have an African American out there today. And if you have any of the sound of my voice, come on in. Let's go to our Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our service. Well, Father God, we thank you ever so much for being with us in this great creation that you made, every cell of it. Thank you, God, for Ashley Baptist Church all the way back to 1896. Thank you, Lord God, for each soul here and each soul that's yours in this congregation and in this town, in this region, Lord God. You have more than you might think. Father God, we pray that everything that we do today is a blessing unto your name. That, Lord God, it exalts Jesus on high, who is our Savior. Let us all lift him up, and he'll bring all men to himself. We thank you, God, for being out here in your world today. It is my Father's world. In Jesus' name, amen. Next Sunday morning, we'll have it back in the sanctuary, 1045. No Sunday school the first several weeks uh, because we want to make sure COVID is gone before we get into that kind of a tighter group. We won't have the children or youth until the fall. So we had the one little boy, he, uh, the only test that was positive in the county was up at Wishick. Little two-year-old boy, he's doing better, but we just want to be real careful as we have an older population, especially right here in the city of Ashley. I want to go ahead and bring on Ray and Virginia Gehring, who have wonderfully, graciously agreed to lead us in worship. Let's give them a hand. Okay. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Here of salvation, purchased of God, born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. 
perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side, angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy whispered of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, in and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Okay, that didn't go too badly. Now we'll go to our next song. Uh, solid Rock. Just wait here for me. Get to my page. Was it 526? Okay, I gotta look at some notes. Okay, the Solid Rock. Okay, okay go to the first note. Okay. My hope is built on nothing else than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his loving face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He enters all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I find in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Okay, you guys are doing pretty good out there. Let's see if we can do even a little bit better. Okay, revive us again. Give us, some, give me the first pitch. Okay, just go back to the first pitch. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of my love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered out night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has home all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. 
Revive us again, fill each earth with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Uh, let's have David Shower come forward, uh, and uh, we will take up an offering today. We also, of course, take that to uh, the news office there on Main Street or to the address for the church, P.O. Box 184 in town. But we'll also give you a chance to give on a great Sunday morning in the month of May. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this nice day that you have given us that we can worship outside. And I pray that uh, all the money is used well. And I pray that the virus would uh, calm down so we can have worship as regular. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to the reading of the word. You're already in your uh, seats there in the car, so uh, you're standing as much as possible. Don't go through the roof now. Make sure the sunroof is open if you decide to stand for the reading of the word in that case. But we are going to Romans 10, verses 1 to 17. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Whew. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his holy word. We're talking about this passage in Romans 10. And as we look at it, we see that our world is unsettled as probably any of us have ever seen it in our lifetimes. It's wobbling one way and then the other. It'll be ferocious one day, it'll be scared the very next. We have momentous events happening almost daily. The stock market, which was making record high after record high, now plunges thousands of points. It goes back up hundreds of points, down thousands of points. All kinds of speculation about what's going to happen here in China. The virus all around the world. Instability is everywhere. The signs of the times are the signs of the end that Jesus Christ gave us himself for the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and elsewhere, as we talked about earlier this year. The only answer that we have to this troubled world is an untroubled Savior who gives the peace that surpasses all understanding. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to study just how important it is to know the Lord and to testify of him if we are saved. In this message, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, from Romans 10, verses 1 to 17. 
Let us pray for our message. Well, Lord God, thank you so much for this chance to come before the people today. Thank you for this fine turnout today on a beautiful North Dakota day. Couldn't be better. The Rough Riders are pleased. And Lord God, we pray that you'll be pleased with this message, that it will touch each hearer, each viewer, as he or she needs to motivate them to testify, to motivate them to seek you and find you with their whole heart. Father God, I pray for salvations. I pray for witnessing. I pray for evangelization coming from this. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. So we go to our uh, first two verses of Romans 10, which read, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Paul, the writer, had been quite zealous wrongly. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as he said, the, the best of the best, they might say. Remember, they were legalists. They knew the Bible so well. But unfortunately, they knew the law, but not the Spirit of God. And the letter kills, but the Spirit saves, does it not? What he would do is he would get orders from the chief priests, <laughs> folks like Caiaphas, who had killed Jesus, to bind those Christians who are out even in the hinterlands, even into Syria, where it is today, Damascus, remember? When Jesus got hold of him, knocked him off his donkey, he was on the road to where present-day Damascus is as well. The city still stands as the capital of Syria. He was thoroughly convinced what he was doing was right, but it was completely wrong, 180 degrees. To the man's credit, he switched around when he found the truth. He admitted his fault, and he went all around the known world of that time, founding church after church after church. We have his letters to them yet today in the New Testament. Many are obsessed today with the wrong goals. They want to control. They want to get ill-gotten gain. They want to satisfy their hate and their resentment. My friends, that is sin leading to death. That is the kind of life that is unredeemed. My friend, you cannot say you love Christ and do these things. We have to be sure that what we are doing in life is from the Lord. How do we do that? We test it by his word. We look into it and we see the works of the flesh, the schisms, the divisions, the outbursts of wrath, all these things that stir hatred and antagonism and envy. We see those fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, loving kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against these, Paul says, there is no law. This is the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And also, witnessing is so very important, giving a reason for the hope that lies within us, with gentleness and respect, but with conviction. That's so important from 1 Peter 3, 15. Also, how do we treat others? How can I hate my brother who I have seen and love the God that I haven't seen? That's posed by James. My friend, we've got to love each other. That means we've got to at least try to like each other. And really, the decision is, though, not an ooey-gooey type of love, just that I hug you every time. It's nice to hug. But that I actually treat you like a human being, according to the Scriptures. So we need to have genuine love doing the best for the person, whether easy or tough, because we want them to be in eternity with us and to have many crowns to cast at Jesus' feet. Verses 3 and 4 of Romans 10 read, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, some say that we're saved by doing or not doing this or that. And that is the very definition of legalism. We say that if I do this, then I get this reward. The Pharisees felt that they were owed heaven because they kept all these little parts of the law. They had all of the rules, but they had none of the love and the grace and the mercy that God wants us to have because we must realize we cannot be perfect. Legalists tend to be strict on the outside and usually very unhappy. On the inside, however, they are wild and untamed because their hearts uh, have agony, their hearts have envy, their hearts have strife. My friend, we need to pray for all the legalists in the church and all the legalists in the world. What is in Islam but extreme legalism without even the promise of eternity unless you blow each other up? 
<laughs> My goodness, could that be more satanic? And yet these people are convinced, convicted and act upon it being the truth. We cannot be desperate to keep rules we think will get us closer to God. Truly the working of the Holy Spirit within us is far more powerful than any willpower that we might possibly have. Yes, we need to try, but we need to pray even more, and we need to seek the Lord even more, and we will find that he is far more powerful and that we have change far more quickly because he will get the glory, not us. We need to repent of sin and follow Jesus. And that frees us from legalism because we realize we're saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. When I got saved, I had no faith in Jesus Christ. I had been antagonistic toward him. I loved to be able to debate preachers on my talk shows in Amarillo and elsewhere. And I would say, you know, you don't believe this, believe that. I would get them into a corner. If they couldn't get out of it, oh, I thought it was great. I'd rub my little hands in glee. And then I became one of those. <laughs> so I tried to study to show myself approved so I don't get back into that corner myself. But we need to realize this is grace. This is all grace. It's none of our earnings. It's just a relationship with God that we are so blessed to be able to have, no matter our background or anything else. Verses 5 and 7 of Romans 10 say, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Now, a lot of people have trouble making sense of what they're trying to say here. Paul was extraordinarily well-educated. I would bet he would have the equivalent of a master's or doctoral degree today. He was an extraordinary writer, not as much of a speaker as we found in studying 1 Corinthians 2 on Wednesday night. When Paul says bringing Christ down, he said, let us not think that we can attain the heights that Jesus has. Okay? Some people think that we essentially are little Christ that are fully equivalent to what he is. <laughs> no, we, we cannot get that way. Mormonism is built on that kind of idea. No, we have to look up to the perfect one. We have not attained or apprehended, as Paul says in Philippians. And he was prob probably one of the greatest Christians of all time, wasn't he? My goodness, he suffered so much shipwreck, uh, was in the ocean a couple of days, he was stoned and left for dead, he fought wild beasts over at Ephesus, everybody was against him, even his own countrymen and his former friends, the Pharisees. But yet he was faithful all the way unto death, and he has gotten one of those biggest crowns of life you could ever imagine. And on ascending into the, descending into the abyss, don't think that being a believer makes no difference in your life. We don't have to be people who think you can lose a salvation to say that you need to have some fruit in your life. Remember that Matthew 13 has the parable of the soils. So really <laughs> very appropriate as we're in a field today. And I know probably the great majority of you have farmed the ground or are connected with that in some way. If I scatter a bunch of seed out here on the highway, nothing's going to happen to it. It's just going to get rolled over and be good for nothing, right? I'm not going to get a crop out of that. I'm probably going to get hit by a semi. I'll meet Jesus sooner than anybody else. But if I get it onto the ground, there's different kinds of ground. We have rocky soil. It's not very deep. Those roots aren't going to go down. And so when the persecution comes to the believer, that word's going to die. That seed's going to die. And then we have those who might pray to receive the Lord. They might get excited. But yet, as they go on, the cares of life come up, the thorns in that ground. Sometimes there's weeds so thick, uh, there's poisonous grasses that are going to choke out the life of that plant that's coming up. But then there's good ground. And fortunately, a lot of this part of North Dakota is good ground. If it's level. Of course, if you've got hills, that's what cattle are made for, right? So you got good ground, and it doesn't just come up one or two-fold. It comes up 30, 60, and 100-fold. There are no secret agent Christians, my friend. Your People will know you by how you treat them. They will know you by whom you give glory to. They will know you 
by who you are and as you represent the Lord, we, you have to remember that. You may be the only Bible that people ever read. And so let us be faithful to that gospel by which we have been saved. We look to Romans 10, 8 to 9. It says, what, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Following Christ is not just going on your merry way, praying a prayer, and just going on with no difference. No, it is a new and living way. It says in Hebrews 10, 20. Hebrews is one of the best books of the Bible for illustrating the majesty, the wonder, and the greatness of new life in Christ. And of course, that Christ who has given it to us. Faith is a present reality. It is also an eternal one. My friends, if you have been saved genuinely, then you have already begun your time in eternity because you will never die spiritually. Oh yes, the body may well die. I don't know that very many more, but I, or within the sound of my voice will. The rapture might be that close. We just don't know. We know we're in the season. We don't know the day or the hour. We keep going until that comes. But we need to live in the light of being eternal beings. Do you want people to say, up in heaven, why did you do that? <laughs> why were you doing it that way? Why did you do this in church? Why did you do that? Why did you not take on another uh, witnessing? Why did you not spend it more? Let's try to take as many as with us as we possibly can and populate that heaven, that new millennial kingdom, the best possible. God is going to change us from the inside out, not the outside in. I've been at churches that say, you know, if you really wanted to know the Lord, you would dress better. If you really wanted to give glory to God, you would wear a nice dress. You would wear a nice suit and all the rest. Well, you know, generally I do wear a suit. You know that. Generally I have a tie on. But I think God is just pleased with me as much right now out in this field being dressed appropriately for it. People wear jeans in fields. They also wear tennis shoes or boots. I imagine nobody goes and plows a field in their dress shoes in North or South Dakota. That would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? Well, it's not about this appearance. It's about the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. But what will happen if you have Jesus on the inside and you are seeking him with all you have? It's going to show up on the outside. And that's what the people see. You get power from the Holy Spirit in a moment in time the filling of the Spirit to be a bold witness, to be able to preach, teach, witness, evangelize, and to be able to show people the way. But then you get perfected by the various fruit of the Spirit coming. And then people see you, that you're around all the time. They see that witness. And they say, I want to have what you have. How did you get that? How did you get the peace when your portfolio went down $10,000 last week with the crash of the stock market? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus? You mean he actually does stuff? Yeah, he actually does stuff. He made the whole world, by the way, <laughs> including your farm. Yes, he'll change us from the inside out. There's an old gospel song that says, something on the inside, showing on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Verses 10 and 11, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You know, Jesus says that if we deny him before men, we will deny him before the Father. He will deny us before the Father. If we confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father in heaven. And so if we know someone is unsaved, we need to tell them how to be. We don't need to just jam it down their throat, but we need to ask a question or two. We need to tell about what's been going on in our life with the Lord, what's been going on in our services, our church, what we've been learning about God. And so they'll at least know how to be saved. They'll know that there is a God who's active in Ashley, North Dakota, in McIntosh County, and in McPherson County. And if we're allowing God to do his work in our life, we will be changed from that old sinful self and that old sinful selfishness. And we will be more and more into Christ's image every day. 
as Romans 8 29 says that those he foreknew those that God foreknew would come to him didn't force him to but he foreknew he knew they would come those he predestined he made sure he made it happen that they will be conformed to the image of Christ you could help along that process by reading your Bible by uh, believing God for his promises by praying by fellowshipping with other believers like we are now or you can stiff arm God like they have with the Minnesota Vikings. The, uh, the old guy gives them a stiff arm because he wants to chase them out of bounds. And that way you're going to retard your progress. God will just keep cinching up that vice on you. He's going to keep cinching and cinching until you just cry uncle to the Father. So cooperate with God. It's for your best, his best, everyone's best. Because we know that Christians really should be known for their love, one for another, and also their love for the world. Because he came, not because he wanted to condemn the world in Christ, but he, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verses 12 and 13, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is one of my favorite verses. This was radical in Paul's day. Jews thought that Gentiles were inferior, were unclean, were unintelligent, uncultured, and unspiritual. They worshipped all these gods made of clay, made of iron, made of various kinds of materials of the earth with their own hands. How bizarre is that? And still, even yet, in some parts of Christendom, people bow down to statues. The statue is nothing but a reminder of what a heavenly reality is. For that it is okay, but that statue has no power in and of itself. And no saint besides God has power to answer your prayer. We need to look to God to be our source, not to each other. If we look to each other, we'll be disappointed because nobody's perfect, but God is perfect. And he will answer our prayers perfectly. And this former Pharisee who looked down on all of these Gentiles, the folks who became today's Italians and Greeks, the Egyptians, all the rest of those. Well, he said that it's just fine wherever you come from, wherever your birth country or state is. If you came from little means or many means, if you're uh, black, red, yellow, all the rest of these, all are precious in God's sight, right? Red, yellow, black, and white, all are precious in his sight. He really doesn't care if you're male or female, but you are one or the other. <laughs> He's made them only in two, my friend. Oh, the devil likes to mess up with our minds, doesn't he? But no, Jesus wants you. Jesus wants me no matter about thee. He just wants your soul because he doesn't want folks going to hell. 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not preached? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We can't pray and be heard unless we're saved. Remember, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that he shall do for you. Isn't that wonderful? Of course, it has to be according to his will. Unfortunately, one of every eight people say that they pray something negative about somebody. Oh, God, kill him. Kill him real good. Do you think God's going to answer your prayer? No, God's not going to answer your prayer, and he's probably going to discipline you for praying that way. No, we've got to pray good for our enemies, and thus we're going to heap those coals upon their head. Conviction. Why is this person I'm trying to hurt trying to bless me? What, what in the world's going on here? I'm confused. <laughs> oh, because the devil in you is getting confused. That's what it is. No, we we're going to win them by the love of Jesus Christ. And if they can't be won, God will take care of us even better because we tried. So we can't pray and be heard unless we're saved. But how do we become saved unless we know about Jesus? And how do we know about Jesus unless someone tells us? Now, you can tell somebody through... Uh, interpersonal contact through one-on-one, -on -one, your friend that you sit down and have lunch with, maybe it's somebody you pass on the street, an old friend that you talk with on the phone too. Maybe it's on the web through the social media. More than half of our area is on, and that's low as far as the country and the world. We could talk about him with family. Now, tell your literal brother and sister, as well as your figurative brother and sister, about the Lord Jesus. Do it at the right time, when God presents the opportunity, when you've been talking maybe about faith, that's the good time to put that in rather than kind of uh, making it automatic. And 
in Paul's day, believers had to literally go and tell. Do you know that Paul accomplished most of his journeys by walking? They didn't have Uber in those days. They did not have pickup trucks. God bless the pickup truck. <laughs> you need to have one if you're a farmer or a rancher, don't you? No, you had to go maybe on a donkey if you were very, very fortunate. Maybe you could get certain places by sea, but you had to walk most of the time and sometimes not even with shoes on, just little old sandals or even your bare feet. And so you literally went and told. My friends, we also have been supporting many missionaries overseas, and they have done some wonderful things in Japan, the Cameroon. We actually have more Christians in places we're sending missionaries to than we have here in our own home county. We have only about 15%. The Cameroon has 70%. They're doing a lot better than we are. Praise God for all those activities. Those are wonderful activities. But my friend, let's not say that our program is only going overseas. Let's say our program is also right here in our seats, right here in the seat of this county. We have to go and tell people right here at home about salvation in Jesus Christ, or these people will be in hell forever. And the last part of our passage, verses 15 to 17 of Romans 10. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I bet quite a few of you know that last sentence, that last verse. If you look at the New Testament Greek, what it was written in, faith comes by hearing refers to what was heard. We receive it into the ear, but into the mind as well. We believe it, and then we act upon it. And what has Jesus told us to do? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Praise God. You are part of the Great Commission and a Great Commissioner. Let's live up to that commission, just like in the army. We're in the army of the Lord, like we were singing before, right? Let's be generals in the army of the Lord. I don't care if you're a private third class in the army. If you are a general in the army of the Lord, it counts far more. But you know what? The stats show us we're not doing very well. In our nation, only one in 20 Christians ever leads someone to Jesus ever has someone pray to receive the Lord with him or her, according to research by Michael Parrott. Evangelicals, which would be us, we believe in the evangel, that is the gospel, the good news of salvation. We, on average, in our country, have only nine spiritual conversations in a year. We only talk about something of faith with somebody nine times a year. That's not even once a month. My goodness, what in the world is happening to us? We have our hearts set on other things. We have our hearts set on the world system and all of the things that it can bring us. It can bring us nice toys, you know, great cars or trucks or whatever else that you like to have around, a beautiful house. There's nothing wrong with those things, but if that's what we're all about, we're lost. That's, that's not a heart that's set on heaven, my friends. It's not a heart set on Jesus Christ. But there are positives, my friend, too. I hate to put you in the ground and not bring you back up. We hear in the media of the white Christianity, all the white evangelicals, and I dare say most of us are white who are here today. But I'll tell you, do you know that 54% of all believers are those of color, especially black folks and Latino folks and all kinds? There's our South Korea. They are a mostly Christian nation. North Korea, you're going to get killed for it, but South Korea, they'll welcome you. And also, of those generations of Christians, you know, the builders of those in the 20s and 30s were born then. Then we had the baby boom, then the Xers like me. The ones who are best at sharing their faith, millennials, the folks under 40. The younger people have very few saved, comparatively maybe 6 7%. But two-thirds of those people testify to folks. Two-thirds of them. That means you're really born. That means you're really seeking the Lord. 
Yes, indeed. They are doing the job. And so God will always preserve a remnant. It might be a small one. It might be tiny in the world's eyes. But do you know how many soldiers that Gideon defeated the vast army with? It was 300. He got the ones who didn't lap. He got the ones who could do the full laps of all that marathon of faith. Friends, we don't need another invitation. If we're saved, if we know Christ, we need to tell others about him before the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is coming soon. How do we do this? We talk with people about what we believe, about what we're doing in the Lord, what we're discovering. You know, I had such a time with this until I read this in the scriptures, and it gave me such peace. How did you get over the loss of your son? Well, I sought God and he gave me comfort that I couldn't even explain. The warmth and the feeling, the love that he must have had, that the God the Father must have had as his son was lost on that cross to death. We take advantage of these opportunities with people, those teachable moments. Also, we need to know why we need to be saved, how we can be saved, and what God has done for us. We can sketch down a few little notes. We think about humanity being born into sin due to the disobedience of Adam and Eve. We had only one rule in those days. There was but one commandment. God said, do not eat of the, knowledge of, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we broke it. <laughs> we broke that one commandment and failed to keep it. Oh, for one. God could have wiped us out right then. No. He decided to kill the animals. No death until then cover us up because we realized we were naked but he sent us on our way too he took us out of the garden of eden and we haven't returned back there since god then gave us a law the mosaic law the moses law to try to help us stay alive you know don't eat shellfish in the desert bad idea doesn't keep well but also don't hate your neighbor don't do evil don't testify falsely against somebody don't uh, do these kind of things covet somebody else's stuff you know, these kind of things for a perfect society in his eyes. But people wouldn't keep it. And if they did try to really keep it, they became prideful about it. Still, he didn't wipe them all out again. Then he sends his perfect son. Talk about patience. He sends his perfect son, his only begotten, to witness to us, to show us how to live and who he would be if he were a human being like us. Then we murder him for it. And in fact, his own people say, give us this murderer, Barabbas. We don't want that Christ. He does too much good. He threatens our position. But Jesus Christ rose again and he freed us. If only we will repent, turn from our worldly ways and live Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, taking up the cross daily, as Luke 9.23 says. That means that we don't do those hateful things that God told us not to do. We do the loving thing that God told us to do, whether it's hard or whether it's easy. And we begin to learn about each other. We realize that we've had some of the same heartaches before. Maybe we've had a family member on drugs. Maybe we've been on drugs. Maybe somebody else has got an addiction to something. Well, you know what? We can begin to share how we got over it. We can begin to sympathize and empathize. We can begin to support one another and pray for one another. And you know what? We all begin to look like human beings to each other again. That is what the church needs to do, and that's what this church needs to do. We also need to count on the Holy Spirit working. You know, if you're relying on yourself, all you've got is self. But if you're relying on God, you've got self and God and a whole lot of others. Because you know what? Over 2 billion people in this old earth named Jesus Christ as Lord. That's a lot of folks. That's the army of God. You will get, if you dwell in the Lord, peace surpassing all understanding, joy unspeakable and full of glory, eternity plus a better life now. As the world is going crazy, we can have that peace and power and passion that the Lord Christ has given us because we, our eternity is settled. And you know, we can lead a person to Christ and have them pray with us right on the spot. I've had that happen in Walmart. I've had that happen in furniture stores. I've had it happen in parking lots. You know, fewer and fewer people are getting saved, but there are more and more opportunities to be able to testify, aren't there? You know, as we go out into all the world, there's every single square inch of this earth that God gave us to praise his name and to tell people about him. And it is so very important that we share our faith. As I'm coming to a close, we have got to keep people from hell. And do you remember a couple of months ago when we were back in the sanctuary, I had a, 
a uh, series called uh, The End of Days. We've had a lot of traffic on that on YouTube, but it's really been helped by the fact that we are in the end of days. We're coming down to the end. But people want to know what's going to happen, and that will help them. That goes just through the scriptures. And that's the best way to think of it, rather than the politics and the names and all this stuff. But what's going to happen is a seven-year tribulation. One of those was life during the tribulation. That is going to be literally hell on earth. Can you imagine a war after we go up in the rapture killing two billion people? A quarter part of the earth is what's talked about in Revelation 6, that chapter with the horsemen. That's only one thing. Do we think we have shortages with coronavirus? Oh my goodness, we're going to have population starving. Entire nation starving to death. This is coming upon the earth. Then, if you're unsaved, you take the mark of the beast to buy and sell. And we have uh, Bill 6666 about this coronavirus and testing and mandatory testing in our Congress right now. I think God's trying to make it easy. <laughs> People are trying to force others is the problem. When you force others, this is a sign of the enemy. And we are going to see those folks go to hell for all of eternity if they don't get saved in that time of the tribulation. You know, it's going to be hard to get saved and resist the mark of the beast when everything in your life, including your food and your family's welfare, depends on it. Friends, let's try to get them to turn to Christ now while there is still time before that night sets. Mark 9, 43 to 48 says this. If you ever have anybody who says, oh, I don't believe that hell is a literal place, Jesus just said it was a metaphor. You know, it, it's just, you know, annihilation that you no longer are. Here's what he said. This is quoting our Lord. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He quoted Isaiah then. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maim rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if that weren't enough, one more time, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, rather than having two eyes, to be cast into hellfire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I think Jesus is trying to make it real obvious that it doesn't end. You know, we go through difficult patches. Some of us have gone through extraordinarily difficult passages. I don't pretend to have the corner on that one. I've talked with a number of you. You've lost a lot of things. You've suffered a lot. People have lied about you a lot. Life is hard. And North Dakota is hard on people. You know, the weather is beautiful today. <laughs> In uh, late December, it wasn't too beautiful, was it, when the snowfall was going horizontal on us? No, it, it's real tough. I admire those settlers who came out here when there were no trees or anything and somehow figured out a way not to freeze to death. Uh, they have my everlasting admiration. But I want to put this into context that we can all find relevant. Do we want our best friends to go to hell? Do we want our sisters-in-law to writhe in pain for eternity? Do we want the men or women at work to never see joy again? Do we not want our next-door neighbors to be spared agony without end? Do we want our enemies to burn forever? Hmm. We need to love our enemies. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44. First Christian bumper sticker I ever had. I love my enemies. That's a tough one. But you know, you begin to pray for them and you begin to understand where the fault and the sins come. It doesn't make that any more right, but it helps us not to hate. It helps us to realize that the devil is the one who's lying and he's using them. And sometimes he uses them in real awful ways. Nope. We don't want those to happen. I pray that you would say you would not want these folks to suffer eternally. What they do to us, even if they're enemies, is only for a while. But it goes away, even at least when we go to heaven. But what they fail to reach, which is Christ, they are going to have to rue for eternity in burning sensation that never ends in pain and turmoil, no fellowship. Oh, it is going to be the worst of all possible destinies. We have to tell them of Christ now. And if they say they're of Christ but not living like him, we have to confront them now. 
we're not promised tomorrow. And do you know what the Apostle John says in his letters? That there is sin that is leading unto death. Don't even pray about confronting people about that. Confront them. You know, we go first one-on-one, -on -one, then we go and we'll take another one or two, then we take it to the church. And we follow it and it works. I've seen it happen, been a part of churches that have done it, and so that's the way we do it here. But you know what? What we can do is hopefully reach these people at the very beginning. And you know what? We begin to be able to love one another when we realize that we are after the best for each other. I don't want to see you disobedient to God and not to have those kind of rewards you should have and not to have the kind of life and peace that you should have here. I want you to know about Christ so that you'll be able to come to peace in the midst of turmoil. I want you to be able to seize unto the promises of God. Did you realize that there are nearly 10 promises of God in the Bible for every day of the year? My goodness, it's amazing what God has given us. 3,500 promises in this 1,100-page book. And so let us pray right now that God will anoint each one of us and us as a church to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Ashley and McIntosh and McPherson counties in the Dakotas and the world, Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Father God, I thank you for the chance to preach the gospel. It is the good news. It is life and life more abundantly. God, put it in our hearts. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can be the witnesses at work. We can be the witnesses at home, on the street, and in the church house, Lord God. Even on the internet, Lord God. Everything can be used for your glory if we will only give it unto you. God, I pray for boldness. God, I pray for strength. God, I pray for love for each one of us, for people so that they will not perish, but they will gain everlasting life. I pray for handing out tracts. I pray for handing out witnessing cards. I pray, Lord, pray, Lord God, handing out Bibles, little Gideon New Testaments too. Father God, let us get the Word of God in the hands of people who would be of God. Father God, anoint us for this task individually and as a church, God. The Baptist Church, our uh, statement of faith says that we must be born again. Let's live up to it, and let's help people to gain eternal life. We thank you, God, for the anointing of the Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And as I always do in services, because you just never know who's looking or who's uh, out in the, uh, this day, the uh, parking lot, we need to be saved. We need to realize we can't save ourselves. The best of us, so to speak, the nicest, the most considerate, folks could just say, oh, that's just him. Or maybe they think they're just nice. No, we have to bow our knee and say that we must be saved. We must repent of our sins, turn from them, say we're sorry for them to God. We must confess Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Lord, and follow him as Lord and Savior as best we can. We also need to uh, believe that he has been risen from the grave on the third day bodily as well as spiritually, that he did what he said he would do and what the Bible says. There is no special kind of prayer, but if it's the desire of your heart to know Jesus, to have that cleansing from sin, to be able to reach people, then repeat after me and you will be able to begin your life with God. Father God, I turn from my sin. Please forgive me. I believe Christ rose on the third day. Bodily, just as he said. I confess faith in Christ and pledge to follow him all my days. Believing in him, taking up my cross. Oh God, come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. And so now, press into God. Press into the Lord. Pray. Read the work of God in the Bible. Also, fellowship. Come to church. See us Wednesday night as well as Sunday. Call us up during the week. Email. Be a part of the family of God and spread the gospel to all the world. Now I want to bring back up Ray and Virginia, who did such a great job in our first round of worship for this response time, as you respond in your heart and mind to the Lord. Okay, take your song sheets, and we'll be singing, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. I 
have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. You are so good with me, still I will follow. Do not go with me, still I will follow. Do not go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Okay, now we'll go to the next song. To glory be God. To God be the glory. Okay. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. No love he the world that he gave his son. He yielded his life a torment for sin. And opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offender truly believes, the moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great and rejoicing, Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder and transfer will Jesus will see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father, Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Good singing, and you guys have a good week. Alrighty, and so thank you very much to uh, Ray and Virginia. Excellent job. Thank you very much to David Shower uh, for taking up our offering and also to Keevan for being able to run the camera here as we reach the masses. I know a lot of folks watch on uh, the cable. We also had many uh, on YouTube. And so let us uh, remember to come back together at the sanctuary Wednesday at 7. Prayer and Bible study, our midweek service is back on. We also have masks and uh, we'll have social distancing, the every other pew. Uh, so for those who are concerned, that's just fine. And also uh, back in the sanctuary next Sunday at 1045, no Sunday school, 1045, but we will have full worship. Let's have our benediction and dismissal. 
Well, Lord God, I thank you for this wonderful day. It has turned out so well. It is wonderful to see these people of God. And we've been hidden away in our homes a lot of the time the last couple of months. But now we're out in the sunshine, the light that you created when you spoke this world into existence. Thank you for its goodness, grace, and warmth. And Lord God, I pray that you order our steps to good and not to evil till next we meet. Lord God, be the protection, provision, and promotion for each. And Lord God, let us be the proclamation of Jesus. Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to a world that needs you. Father God, let us encourage folks today in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed, and you're also loved by your pastor and God. Amen.